Hello all, welcome to Art Salon, um, South Florida Art Salon. I'm Ellie Shore and I've been um, hosting and organizing art salons for over 10 years, since 2012. This is my way of contributing to building a real art community in South Florida. Our artist tonight is Lauren Shapiro. She is a ceramic artist. She got her master's degree in ceramic art from the University of Miami, and she is based in Miami. She's got studio space in Bakehouse, and I've, I've visited her studio there. It's a wonderful, wonderful place, and uh, it's fun to visit in, in, in the studios and see what people are doing. Lauren has become deeply, deeply committed to dealing with the environment and specifically with coral reefs and with plant life. And in some ways, the culture gets weaved into her work, but mainly the ecology and the uh, changes taking place in our environment here in South Florida and in other places around the world. She is uh, collaborating with scientists and people who are deeply involved in technology as it's developing rapidly. Uh, she's incorporating technology into her work in, in many new digital ways. So it is my great pleasure to introduce you to Lauren Shapiro. Hey, everyone. Thank you, Ellie, for that lovely introduction. And thanks for inviting me to talk at the Art Salon. It's nice to see some of you, meet you, some I know, some I don't. Um, thanks for tuning in, listening to uh, my work and, and what I'm going to share today. So uh, for this presentation, I was just going to give a general overview of what it is that I do. I'm going to show images uh, over the last 10 years. But uh, basically, my background is I am uh, born and raised in South Florida, which uh, being a native is not always very common around these parts. Um, I grew up in Broward County in a town called Coral Springs, which I don't know if anyone has been to Coral Springs, but there's not a lot going on. A lot of car dealerships and urban sprawl. And one of the things that always struck me about living there is that Coral Springs is an urban town, and then there's a highway, there's the Sawgrass Express Highway, and then directly on the other side is the Everglades. And it's this road that just completely separates the people from the nature. It's such a harsh split that you can't even, you cannot access the Everglades from the town. You would have to actually go into the national park. So that was always one of the things that always uh, struck me about the place that I grew up. Um, as a kid, uh, like my nerdy fact about me is that my parents enrolled me in something called the Girl Scouts, which is when they uh, group young kids together to go out and be in nature and you earn little badges um, to, you know, forage or learn about seeds. We did a lot of beach cleanups and I stuck with it, you know, through a for a long time, almost 10 years from age probably six to like 15, um, really diving into Florida ecology and nature. And I didn't realize until much, much later in my career how much that actually affected the work that I do. My practice as a ceramicist started when I was in my early 20s. I went to, I, I went to a regular high school. I went to Terravilla High School in Coral Springs, not an art school. Art was one of my, my talents and passions uh, at the same time, as well as performing arts. And I ended up going more in the direction of fine art, I think, because I just wanted to sort of hide behind the work that I do. I didn't realize, obviously, until later, how much an artist has to promote themselves and talk about their work and be a part of their work as like a front facing representative. Um, so I guess those formative years of performing arts did help me in that regard. I went to college at FAU, Florida Atlantic University in Boca Raton, and I fell into ceramics by accident. I was taking art classes and the only one that was available to me to start my art curriculum for a BFA, Bachelor of Fine Arts, was ceramics on the wheel. So I was like, yeah, I'll try ceramics on the wheel. Pottery sounds cool. I wanted to be a painter. I was always painting and drawing. That was what I usually did. Uh, so I took a pottery class and I just fell in love with the medium. And I think this happens to a lot of people. You either love clay or you hate clay. But um, I've taught clay for many years as well. And I see people just like absolutely enamored with with the medium of clay. So I took a, a pottery class 
Then I took a second one. Then I took a figure sculpting class. Then I started taking hand building and sculpture. And before I knew it, I was 15 credits deep into a ceramics major. And I figured, well, I guess I'm, I'm going to do clay now. So that's how it started for me. And I learned how to hand build. It was more, for me, I was more interested in sculpture. And actually the work that I was doing at the time was very inspired by the ocean, which also came full circle in the work that I do. Hand building sort of like creatures and animals, a lot of repetition and carving. I used to make these vessels and carve them with a lot of repeated patterns. And in about 2011, I decided that I wanted to step up my game. Like I lived in Boca Raton and I lived in Del Rey and I was working at the Boca Raton Museum of Art as an art instructor in the Boca Raton Art School teaching art uh, to kids. And I had a warehouse in Delray Beach and, and everything was great for a couple of years, but I really wanted to step into the world of professional art, contemporary art. And I knew that I had to move to a major city. So Miami and Florida is where it's at for contemporary art. I applied to the University of Miami and I was accepted on a full ride. They actually, if you get the fellowship, they will pay entirely for your school and they actually pay you to teach. So that was sort of my Hail Mary, got me out of Boca Raton and moving down here in 2012. So I'm going to take you a little bit through that undergrad work, and it might be interesting for you to see uh, the evolution of the practice over the last 10 years uh, and how I've uh, used my skills as a mold maker, which is what I studied uh, during my MFA, making molds. For those of you not familiar with ceramic processes, mold making is when you create a plaster negative to produce multiples of a ceramic positive. And you can do this by pressing clay into a mold to avoid space to make an impression, or you can use liquid clay to make like a hollow form that you can then use as multiples for installation. You can use them for hand building and the list goes on. So when I was in grad school, I really wanted to explore the ephemerality of materials. I think when, you know, as a grad student, I can remember, you know, they really, they kind of unpack you. And for anyone who's never done their MFA, they sort of break you down and unpack you. And then you have to try to figure out why you make what you make, what you do, why you do what you do, who are the ones that have done it before you. Um, and so I was really interested in exploring materials. I also had a hobby, or I guess it was a, it was more of like an obsession with origami paper. So at the time I was folding things in increments of a thousand as a way to deal with anxiety or this extra energy that I had. So I would just literally sit there and compulsively fold origami in increments of a thousand. I did a thousand cranes, uh, which pulls from the Japanese legend tradition story of the thousand cranes whoever folds a thousand cranes gets their heart's desire so i would do these thousand increments and sort of think about an intention behind it so it was more of a meditation so i folded a thousand cranes i folded a thousand boats i folded a thousand frogs i folded a thousand paper airplanes like and that's really what i was doing when i entered grad school and so they were basically like all right you know you have to do ceramics so i started converting some of these paper forms into porcelain and and these are some of the images that you see here these are uh, porcelain airplanes on the left. So they're made out of, uh, I made a mold of a paper airplane and then hand pressed these uh, individual porcelain forms and then sanded them down until they were paper, paper thin and then fired them. And on the right hand side, it's a crumpled piece of paper, a folded piece of paper that I was able to capture in porcelain as well. And then here you can see some process. On the left is a shot from the studio at UM. These were some of the molds that I was making. So for those of you who don't know what a plaster mold looks like, this is what they look like. I'm also very obsessive compulsive, obviously with the origami obsession, labeling things, organizing things, stacking things. I was looking at artists like Edmund DeWall, Yaoi Kusama, even Anne Hamilton, and the way that they uh, use a lot of repetition in their work to create an environment or an experience. On the right-hand side, you can kind of see process. So that white thing here is a plaster mold. The one in the middle is the positive and the one on the right is the folded piece of paper. So these, I was learning how to do double wall molds. I was learning how to make multi-part molds. So very, very technical. This is actually the first project that I showed my first semester at UM, not ceramic. This was at the Fat Village in Fort Lauderdale. It was a thousand origami boats. And a lot of the boats had handwritten letters on them or check marks or mark making or different types of things. And for me, I was really interested in, in installation, light and uh, creating immersive environments. And obviously with ceramics and learning the skills that I was doing, it wasn't possible to do it like that. So this is sort of a sketch. And I've, you know, I think from the very beginning, I really wanted to create immersive environments and installation, but obviously these things if you've ever tried to do them, they're very time consuming, they cost money, 
you need a lot of help to do them. So um, the, the paper was a really great way to explore that. From the origami, I started moving into casting geometric forms to create systems and stacking shapes. So this was a stack shape series. This was probably towards the end of my master's degree and what my thesis was based on. It was a show called Polygon. And I ended up settling, I cast a lot of these different geometric forms, exploring um, the whole idea that was sort of like sacred geometry patterns that occur across nature from, you know, molecules to atoms to crystals to, to literally anything in nature. There is a geometry in it and a pattern in it. So for me, this was sort of a, like an elemental way to kind of explore figure and form or form through uh, geometry. So these are stacked porcelain shapes that are very precarious all these porcelain forms are hollow and I build them in sections and there's actually a steel rod that goes through the center of it with concrete in the bottom. So they were able to kind of cantilever. Uh, very beautiful series. I don't really make them like that anymore because they are super fragile. This is another series I produced towards the end of my degree. Um, fortune tellers based on the, when you're a kid, you know, those fortune teller games you play. This is a casting um, about seven inches in diameter by four inches in depth. Uh, so a little bit larger than life. While I was in school, I got the opportunity to do a residency in Jindazhen, China, which is in Southeast China. I was invited by the owner of a residency in the town on the top of this beautiful mountain. Basically, there's a town in China called Jindazhen. If anyone's heard of Ai Weiwei, that is where he produced all of his porcelain seeds for the Tate Modern. And a lot of ceramics that he does comes from this town. I did two months there. And what I really learned was that in this place, it's all about production. So there's not one single artist that does everything. There's a mold maker. There's a slip caster. There's someone who fires the kilns. There's someone who, like, you buy the glazes from. You take the glazes. You bring it to the glaze person. They do the glazing. You bring it to the kiln person. And the whole town kind of functions on this ceramics economy to mass produce objects. Everything from mugs, cups plates to figurines. And I got to visit a lot of these different factories and just see different modes of production, which I feel like had a, a big influence on me as a mold maker uh, and someone who does production. I even got to do a lecture in front of like 300 Chinese students and professors that was translated in, in the town, which was really interesting. And that was a really great opportunity. I've actually, as an artist, I've been able to finagle my way into international experiences, <laughs> which is a really, uh, great way to subsidize international travel, especially as a young artist, to experience different cultures, different modes of production, different materials. And it's been so hugely beneficial to me. Um, this is a piece that I had for my, produced in my thesis show um, called Genesis. So this is the solid shapes that are sort of amalgamating and growing. And then the shapes themselves are either floating away or, or falling back down and amalgamating back into this form. So the final show that I did was a lot of these polygonal forms in different formats as the culmination of my studies at UM. I also did some, some projection explorations, which I threw in here because the last show I did incorporates uh, physical objects and digital projections. So I've been thinking about this for a while as a way to create different sorts of immersive environments and playing with light, color, and form. So on the right is a series of the polygon um, fortune tellers. On the left is a photograph of the pieces with different colored lights. I also did a lot of experiments with projection onto the shapes. Um, at the time, I wasn't doing any of my own video or content. This was just experimentation with light and color and um, moving clouds and sunrise, sunset, or, or recordings of, of the ocean. Here's another example of a, an early work using physical objects and projection. And this is just a recording of the ocean on Miami Beach projected over these different types of shapes. On the left is one uh, projected onto a mirror with concrete shapes. So these are kind of interesting because my most recent project has been pulling from these elements again, and this was like five years ago. So you never know what kind of, uh, you, all the work that you're producing is usually, usually ends up somehow back into your work at some point. I was also doing different types of collaborations with other artists. I love to collaborate with my work, whether it's with people outside of the fields. I work very interdisciplinary in that way. I work a lot with scientists to uh, help communicate their research, uh, as well as other artists. This is an example of a project I did for the Collabo show in Miami, like probably about three, four years ago. This is an artist, Magnus Sodoman, who is a 
brilliant impressionist painter that uses a lot of color in his work and we cast a monumental table for a one night show in the downtown abandoned Payless. It was a blast. Um, kind of a Miami tradition is the Collabo show. I don't know if any of you have been to any of these shows, but anyone can participate. You just need a collaborative partner and just madness ensues. And so we might have stolen the show with this one. It was a giant table filled with concrete fruit, flowers, candles, and what was interesting for me is to really pull in some of the color element into my work, which is what Magnus does a lot with his paintings. So moving more into the content that I'm now weaving into my work and the narrating and the storytelling. So you've seen my background, you know, I come from South Florida and my background with nature and, and being out in the environment and my fascination with these types of subject matters, as well as the the form and the techniques that I use in my work, which is mold making. And when I got out of school, I really wanted to use the vocabulary that I developed to talk about the issues that I see threatening our environment and, and threatening our home, as well as the different types of systems that are, um, you know, like in or out of balance, right? Florida is a fascinating place. We have some of the most amazing ecology. We have the Everglades, we have mangrove forests, we have um, the ocean, we, we have some reefs. We used to have uh, a lot of reefs. Florida is home to the Florida Reef Track, which is I think the second largest reef track in, in the United States, not the world. And it's very, very rapidly changing. Most of our, our corals have, 80% uh, of them are now gone, they're anticipating the rest to be gone within the next 10 years if we don't do some uh, some changes. But I wanted to think about these different types of systems and you pull from my experience as a ceramicist, pull from my experience as an educator and try to engage people with the work that I do. So one of the first pieces I did that was an installation with unfired clay was this piece here. It was an exhibition in the downtown historic post office. It was another abandoned space that was used for a group show during our Basel. The show called the artist was called Raw, as in this is a raw space, do whatever you want. And I had this idea since I spent most of my time in grad school trying to keep ceramics from cracking or breaking or being destroyed. What if I embrace that materiality of the clay and really got into the, the tactility of the clay and used it to kind of wrap or surround one of these columns as an architectural feature. And so this was an experiment I did, I think this was 2017, where I went around the city and I took silicone mold impressions of different types of plants. So some of these are native plants, some of these are invasive plants, there's mangroves, there's ferns, there's um, cypress leaves, all of these are mostly leaves or bark. And I brought them to this space to basically create a site-specific installation that was only going to last the duration of the show. And so what I quickly discovered, I was teaching at New World School of the Arts at the time, and we had two days to do this installation. And I realized after, you know, one hour of working on it, how long it was actually going to take. There was no way I would be able to do this all by myself. So I reached out to my students, to other artists and friends, and people were really willing. They're like, what? Like, build a crazy clay installation? Yeah, I'm down. So like 10, 15 people showed up over the course of two days. And we basically built this installation by pressing clay into the molds of the leaves and the different shapes and then attaching them to this wire armature. And what I realized is one, not only how powerful it is to collaborate, to create something much larger than I could do myself, but that people were really into it. They really enjoyed the process. They were asking me, let me know if we can do more, if you need more help. They really liked being part of that process. And um, I thought that was really cool. And so I started using these types of community oriented themes in my work. And also this installation, it goes up and then a week later it's broken down and recycled. So clay, if you don't fire it, can be reprocessed and reused. So for me, this was another great way to create less waste and to create more of a green project that didn't have any um, you know, carbon offset through firing kilns. So after I did that project, I really wanted to dive a little bit deeper into ecology and looking towards one of the most vibrant rainforests in the world, the Amazon rainforest in South America. There's a program called Labi Vergi, which is in uh, Brazil and uh, specifically in Manaus. And I saw this call to artists, which they do every year. If you're an artist, you can apply. I highly recommend. It was incredible that if you are selected, they will take you on a 10-day excursion in Manaus where you get to talk to scientists, 
they'll take you around to um, the native villagers that live in the town that live off the land. And you basically get to learn about this incredible ecosystem, both from the locals, from scientists and people that live there or, or you know, stakeholders in this land. And so I was selected to do it, which was amazing. They picked, I think, 16 of us, all different countries from around the world, dancers, photographers, sculptors, painters, people that draw, people that do graphic design, people that do music to come and experience and share what we do with, with each other and, and, and see the rainforest itself. And so this was really impactful for me to see, uh, to really get a deep dive into, into ecology and, and, and botany, specifically with tropical plants and how these things grow and evolve and how special it is and, and how much it needs to be protected, how important it is to the ecosystem of the world. And so when I got back, I basically went out there and I did, on the left-hand side, you see these little purple blobs. So I had a suitcase full of silicone and basically I cast all different leaves and textures. I cataloged them. And when I came back, I uh, built this circular sort of piece on the wall of my studio and photographed it. And that was my contribution to uh, the catalog that they published with all the artists work from the Amazon. And so here you see sort of like a cycle of life. I was really taken by how fast things grow and how fast things die and in, in the Amazon. Like, for example, we did a hike in the morning and there was a giant moth, huge, on the side of the, the path that was dead. The ants were starting to, you know, pick off and take apart. And by the time we came back an hour and a half later, the moth was almost gone. So the, the, the cycles of life move very fast in the Amazon. It's a very, very, like, fertile place. And to me, that that rapid sort of circle of life, life and death was the inspiration behind this, this artwork here. Some of the other projects that it influenced, making some ceramic wall pieces, casting some of the tropical leaves and experimenting with different glazes and shapes and different types of installations. And I produced a series of objects that was inspired by that trip using the molds as well as experimenting with the geometry and pulling in different types of leaves and, and playing with balance and, and trying different arrangements of the shapes, progressing into more diamond forms, circular forms, uh, and different types of colors in the work. And this is around like 2018, 2019 with some of these objects. Then uh, in 2019, I applied for the Wavemaker grant, which is due in two weeks. If anyone is an artist and wants to apply, um, it's put forth by Locus Projects and it's money from the Andy Warhol Foundation to realize a project that deals a lot with the community. And so I reached out to Fairchild Tropical Botanic Garden in Miami, which is one of the most magical places on earth. If anyone's uh, never been, I highly recommend you check it out. It's basically a curated like landscape of every type of tropical plant you can imagine, as well as like desert plants and different types of ecology where they cultivated in this landscape that's just gorgeous. And I applied with a grant to do a site-specific unfired clay project with the community uh, working with Fairchild Tropical Garden on site. And so for my project, I got to take a deep dive into the garden pulling from those past works that I did. These are some uh, examples of how I was casting some of the shapes on the right-hand side as a bird of paradise. The people that work the landscaping took me around. They helped me clip things that I was allowed to take so that I could cast. I spoke with a lot of ecologists on site. One of the things that was the most fascinating to me of learning about Florida ecology was that South Florida is home to tropical and temperate plants. It's the way that they described it to me was like a Venn diagram of overlapping circles of plants all the way up to like North Carolina and even beyond. And also plants from South America can all exist in South Florida, in Florida in general. The, our, our ecosystem is, is so supportive of lots of different types of plants. And so a lot of the plants that we see here are not native. Most of the native plants are getting pushed out into the Everglades. And a lot of the tropicals that you see here, Monseras, Birds of Paradise, all these big, beautiful tropical plants are actually not from Florida. They're from South America or the Caribbean. So that was really interesting to me, the idea of these, these, these land boundaries of where these plants actually come from. And so with all of these molds, I hosted a series of workshops where people could participate by pressing clay into the molds. I amassed them in these sort of wet boxes to keep them moist. And then over the period of a weekend, we constructed a post and lintel arch 
over the entrance to Fairchild, which the fact that they let me do this is a miracle because it was completely experimental. Uh, it was very kind of them. They actually had to rope off the entrance for the first week just to make sure that no pieces were going to fall and hit anyone on the head. But they were really nice to me and they they let me do something completely experimental. And I made for a really unique photograph of these unfired clay, fragile, temporary textures that would be actually taken apart and destroyed. And so the idea was that the community is coming together to build these installations, even though we spent hours and hours and all this labor, in just a matter of mere hours, um, it can be completely destroyed. So speaking about the fragility of the environment and, and hosting workshops to kind of talk about care and how we can uh, protect and preserve our uh, botanicals in Florida. And here are some details of the cracking and the drying on the frame. All of the clay, uh, when I've done these projects, the clay cracks and dries and turns colors through this, there's this really interesting element of time, but ultimately it stays attached to the frame because as it shrinks, it grabs onto this wire. So it will stay there until it's disturbed by people or water, which is pretty much a metaphor to what's happening to our environment in the South Florida. So in 2020, I was approached by a friend of mine. Uh, her name is Nissa Silviger. She is a amazing marine ecologist who teaches at California State University, Northridge. And she's a scientist. And she had seen the work that I was doing online through social media. And she asked me if I wanted to collaborate on an unfired clay participatory public art project, except this time with coral reefs. And if you remember how I said I was a Girl Scout as a kid, she was also a Girl Scout, but her mother was the troop leader. So we hadn't spoken in 25 years. So this was actually the, the chance that we had to kind of reconnect over professional practices. So the first thing I did was get scuba certified at Tarpoon Lagoon on South Beach. And one of the locations they took us to is this location. It is off the coast of Key Biscayne. It's called Neptune Memorial Reef. These are just some internet images, but basically uh, an architect and a sculptor constructed this reef, this artificial sort of uh, colonnade kind of architectural structure to act as an artificial reef, but it's also a graveyard. So if you want, and you love scuba diving, and you think your family will come visit you when you are gone, you can be cremated into a shape of concrete, and they will actually secure you to the floor, and coral reefs will actually grow on you. Um, you can see here, down here by this diver's foot, there's a little seashell. That is one of the kind of headstones. So scuba diving in this place that was filled with essentially death, while there was a reef growing on top of it to show life, was really an influence onto this project that I did with Nissa. So for the project, uh, unfortunately, the original idea was, this is how she enticed me to do this. She said, I'm going out to French Polynesia, which is Tahiti, Morea, where we are studying uh, shallow water corals. Come with me, cast all these corals, and then you can do an art project about it. But since it was COVID, literally when I did my first workshop with her in LA, right afterwards, COVID shut everything down. We ended up sourcing a lot of these impressions of corals, coral skeletons locally from the University of Miami, from FIU, and it actually ended up really being positive because I was able to connect with the scientists locally and do something really regional. So the idea was that people, I invited the community to participate in these public workshops where we would actually construct a large scale installation of coral reefs together. So here you can see some snippets or some screenshots from a video that we produced that basically showed how we built this project. So over 300 volunteers came through and helped me build this project. It's called Future Pacific, and it is a series of seven architectural ruins that appear to be sinking or being submerged underwater, covered with unfired clay coral textures. It took us about a month and a half to build this installation. Um, you can see here, some of the pieces fell off, they were swept away, but ultimately it stayed like that for about eight months until it was dismantled and destroyed. All of the clay was recycled and it took me about two years, but I actually about six months ago just gave the last of the clay away to a UM grad student. So every single piece of this installation was recycled. So I'm very proud of myself for, <laughs> for doing that because it was quite an endeavor. But you can see here different angles of this installation. It took about a month and a half. 
was very hard, especially with socially distanced, but we managed to do it and uh, we produced a beautiful video to go along with this project. And here's some images of what it looked like before. So basically I designed the exhibition. I used a maquette, like a model. This was at the Bakehouse Art Complex in Miami where I have a studio. So it was fairly simple to be able to store the clay, produce the clay, like process the clay. A lot of the unfired clay I used in the exhibition was recycled from different schools and universities. I basically went around and asked people for all the hardened clay that they didn't want and recycled it. It was an enormous endeavor, enormous labor, but the uh, result was, was amazing. And here's a close-up of some of those different types of textures in, in the installation. So usually when I give presentations to scientists, like I do a lot of, uh, especially with my colleague, Dr. Nissa Silbiger, and just other sort of science focus groups about art and science, I kind of like to parallel how art and science are like. Both artists and scientists are searching for intrinsic truths. Why is it true? What is it true? Why does it matter? How can we move society forward? There's a learning experience that occurs by thinking and doing. An art studio and a scientist lab, very, very similar places for discovery and research. We go out into the field, we come back, we produce, we go out into the field and share, we come back and produce. And both artists and scientists typically approach problems with the similar open-mindedness and inquisitiveness. We, we want to know why, and we, we want to figure out why. Uh, so I always thought that was very rewarding about working with scientists and students of science. So after this project, um, we were able to actually get out to French Polynesia. And without turning this into a slideshow of an epic vacation, which was amazing, I went out to the field with Dr. Silbiger to Morea in French Polynesia to actually see what a real coral reef looks like. Up until now, I've only snorkeled in Florida reefs. It's not looking so good. It's pretty dismal out there. Our reefs are in serious decline. There's also a lot of soft coral as opposed to hard coral that they have in this, at the Pacific Ocean. These are some images of Maria, which is an incredible um, sort of microcosm of the world. It's, if you don't know where French Polynesia is, it's below Hawaii, all the way out in the middle of the Pacific Ocean. It's like a tiny, tiny dot between New Zealand and the United States. And it's home to some amazing coral growth. So when I was out there, I was basically observing and taking in what a real reef looks like. And what Dr. Silbiger does, you can see on the right-hand side, that's Nissa carrying her little inflatable tube. And what her research is based on is studying how the effects of groundwater are causing nutrients to bloom in the water and the overgrowth of algae onto the coral. So you can see on the left-hand side, bottom left, there's algae. They look like these kind of stocky sort of um, cauliflower looking broccoli things. The nutrients in the water are causing the blooms to basically grow and they suffocate the coral because the coral needs sunlight, sunlight and photosynthesized to survive. A lot of this is actually happening in our own backyard in Biscayne Bay. Maybe you've heard about the algae blooms. Um, we have a massive, like apparently, island coming towards the coast of Florida this summer of algae. It suffocates the fish. It starves them of oxygen. And how this occurs is because the Morea specifically is a plantation for pineapple and different types of tropical fruit, as well as the hotel industry. All the detergents, all the fertilizers, all the soaps, all the things that we put down the drain seep through the ground through tiny cracks and they actually bubble out onto here onto the reef. And so Nissa's research is based on basically documenting how it is affecting the reef ecosystem. So even though it looks like an amazing vacation, these scientists work super hard. They're up all day, all night sampling groundwater and then carrying thousands of pounds of groundwater back to LA where they will process it in their lab for research. So uh, while I was out there, I had already done so much work on this project. I was really there to observe. And so trying to figure out how to make art with the materials that I had around me. So I brought some silicone. I cast some of the skeletons that were available at the research station. And I was, while watching these scientists sort of hustle and, and, and kill themselves over or sampling these groundwaters, I felt pretty helpless. It was actually almost a little depressing, which being in the most beautiful place on earth and, and feeling bummed out is, is a weird feeling. But so I started doing these sort of sand mandalas where I was pressing the silicone molds into the ground to create these different types of patterns. I think you can see it here on the left-hand side and then sort of watching the ocean sort of wash them away and eliminate them, which is kind of the futility that I felt watching these poor scientist students haul water knowing that 
time is not on their side. And here's uh, the Black Sand Beaches of Tahiti, as well as the research site. This is where Nissa conducts a lot of her research. There's a lot of groundwater seepages on this particular beach. And then the best part was being able to scuba dive and see an actual real live coral reef, a thriving coral reef, which this was my first experience. This probably was my fourth or fifth dive. So I was like scared to death going down 65 feet underwater, but just looking out and literally seeing football fields of this type of coral, as far as you can see, it was absolutely amazing. And so that's something that's really special. That's actually a, a, a privilege. Not a lot of people get to see this kind of amazing thing. And so I think really after that trip, I started to focus a lot more on underwater ecology and benthic environments and start to weave that into my work. So around this time, maybe a little sooner, I did a workshop at a residency called Anderson Ranch Art Center in Colorado. It's basically Club Med for artists. They have every type of tool facility that you can imagine. They have technicians to make all of your dreams come true. So I did a workshop called Digital Fabrication for Mold Making. And what that means is using digital technology like a CNC, 3D modeling, uh, 3D printing, to basically uh, create prototypes or create molds in modular systems. My goal here really was to use these different types of tiling systems to construct bigger elements, um, sculptural elements, which I've been working my way up to ever since. I also did a residency with Ulite Arts as a uh, Home and Away Fellow in 2020, right before the pandemic. So I did a workshop two years prior, learning how to use these tools for ceramics, went back with Ulite on a fully funded residency to experiment and play with all of these different tools for a full month. And I created a bunch of uh, several different types of tiling systems for, for ceramic molds. So on the right-hand side, these white objects are CNC'd, which is a computer numeric tool that actually carves material away based on a file. And you can see here on the left, sort of a step-by-step -step about how this is made. And here on this little computer model here is uh, in the software called Rhino which is a 3D modeling software. So I used a lot of this technology to produce this project, which exhibited at Fairchild Tropical Botanic Garden for a Night Arts Challenge Award that I got in 2020, basically using those modular tiling systems to produce the base tiles, except incorporating uh, the different textures from the garden, different types of fruits, and weaving in the geometry and pressed clay leaves that I sourced from Fairchild to create sort of the decorative element of these of these tiles to create these two arches. Mm -hmm. Through this project, uh, through the Night Arts Challenge Award, part of my idea was to bring the community into creating something that would be lasting. So through a series of outdoor workshops, I invited the community to come in, help press these clay leaves, which I later cleaned up in the studio, assembled and fired onto these ceramic tiles. And it was exhibited in the Tropical Conservatory and Rare Plant House in 2021. So this was a site-specific installation of all of the, the plants that the community helped to produce in collaboration with my vision to create these sort of portals. It's called garden portals. So it's sort of inviting you into this space. This particular greenhouse is amazing. It has basically all these rare, incredible tropical plants, some of which you'll see repeated in the mural. And that's where it lived for several months. Some other projects I've produced with the digital fabrication, you saw the earlier molds that were kind of curved. These are different types of modular systems. This one's called Flora Medallion uh, with different types of fruits, leaves, different Florida ecological plants and, and different types of edible fruits that you'll see in, these mur in this mural here. There's a close up another experiment. And most recently, this was at the Green Space Miami in November that won uh, a grant to produce this project. It's called Three Rivers. This is another uh, modular ceramic mural. The base of the tile is based on a 3D scanned coral reef ecosystem, which kind of talks about Florida, which the ground that we are standing on is actually an ancient coral reef. And then there's shells and fruits and different types of plants. And this project was really inspired by the agricultural history of South Florida, particularly of Little Haiti. It used to be uh, a citrus groves in the uh, early 1900s, late 1800s. A lot, a lot of the original settlers grew these types of fruits uh, for their livelihood, which later then uh, was eradicated, obviously, with the real estate industry that kind of came in and, and took over South Florida, the hotel industry. But still, if you come to Miami, 
in people's backyards, in public parks and cooperatives, you see a lot of mango trees, a lot of avocado trees, sometimes even star fruit or lemon trees uh, still standing today. So that's what this project was inspired by. So getting into the tech stuff, I've done a couple of projects working with photogrammetry for digital mold making. So on the left-hand side, these are 3D scans of benthic environments by an organization called the Mega Lab, led by Dr. John Burns, who is a professor of data marine science at the University of Hawaii at Hilo. It was introduced to him through my colleague, Dr. Silbiger, and was fascinated by what he was doing and this idea of these 3D modeled underwater landscapes that we normally can't see or access. And so I started playing with these different models and grafting them onto different surfaces for tiling projects, such as these here. These are two different kind of prototypes for mosaic tiles using modeling for molds where I'm pressing clay tiles into the mold to create a landscape or slip casting them on the left. The one on the right was from a CNC. The one on the left was from a 3D print. And then um, here you can see some examples of the 3D printed prototypes that I then cast in molds. On the left-hand side is a sculpture incorporating some of all of the different elements I've been experimenting with, including these corals. On the top left here is me taking a scan of a coral. So while I was out in Morea, I learned, I started experimenting with photogrammetry. Photogrammetry is basically when you take multiple photographs of an object from all different vantage points and then you put the photographs into a software, it stitches it together into a 3D model. Uh, and from that 3D model, you can do AR, VR, 3D printing, lots of different things. So I've been experimenting with these data sets in a lot of different ways. Here's another example. So this is a beautiful, uh, looks like, I guess it's a plating coral, looks like a rose, rose coral, they call it, famous, famous uh, coral reef in Tahiti. It's 150 feet deep, so that's why it's so pristine. A lot of people can't get to it. And on the right-hand side, this is a similar species that's been 3D modeled. So with these 3D assets, I can, I've been sort of taking branches and printing them. You can kind of see here, this is one of the branches from that model. And then just some under the hood uh, of what the photogrammetry looks like in the software. These are different 3D models that I scanned when I was in French Polynesia. These are coral skeletons from the research station. And all these little sort of flat panels are where the camera is located. So the cool thing about the technology is you can actually see where all of these uh, camera angles are located. I've also been experimenting with photogrammetry with architecture since I do have an interest in structural building objects moving into public art. These are all scans I took at the Metropolitan Museum of Art, different types of colonnades, columns, capitals. Uh, and this is sort of what it looks like in 3D. It's very, very high definition. Sometimes there's holes in things that you can actually go in and sculpt and change and, and move the data around, which I find super interesting. It's also very accurate to preserve and document 3D objects such as sculptures. So here's a photograph of one of my sculptures, and here is a 3D scan of one of the sculptures. This is actually fairly easy to do if anyone's interested in doing it. If you have an iPhone, one of the newer iPhones with a LiDAR scanner, you can actually download an app, which is what I used for this one, an app called Scandi Pro. Uh, and you can actually preserve or document your 3D objects for all of time. Uh, which I find super interesting. One of the last big projects I've done, this was at the end of 2021 for a program called No Vacancy. It's a juried art competition that takes place during Art Basel every year on South Beach. This is the second year they put out the call to art. And I proposed a monumental sculpture that would be outdoors showcasing the textures and the forms of a coral reef ecosystem that no longer exists. So this project was from a 3D scan called Site R16 Transect 1, which is the location at the northwestern Hawaiian Islands. This is a reef that unfortunately was decimated in 2018 because a hurricane went very far north, fueled by the warmer waters of climate change, took a far turn further than anyone expected and basically mowed down this ancient reef that had plating corals the size of cars, and now they're gone. So. Luckily, you can see in the top right-hand corner, this is the scan. And then underneath it, the blue object is a CNC'd model. 
which I then cast and mold to uh, produce these different ceramic tiling systems that are stacked inside of this gold frame monolith. And the idea was sort of like a memorializing uh, a reef that no longer exists. So here's some of the processes, basically taking some of these more complex sort of like 3D models and unraveling them to flatten them into these kind of shapes. I'm still kind of playing around with this technology to create more dimension. This, I would say, is like a low relief, which is when I can cast directly in a, a tile, but I've been able to add different things on the surfaces of the tile to create more dimension. So you can see here some models of a Pastelopora coral, which is a Pacific plating coral, and then you can see some of them sprinkled in here in this little ceramic sculpture, along with leaves and different types of geometry. This is fairly new things that I've been experimenting with over the last two years, and it's been immensely exciting and rewarding because as a ceramicist, I'm working with an ancient medium. Clay itself is an old, is old technology. It is one of the first technologies of mankind throughout civilizations. From the first Neolithic person that sculpted a little clay man and threw it into a fire, and the next morning, clearing the fire, realized that it was hard to cooking, to storage, um, jars, all sorts of things. It's really shaped our civilization. So kind of weaving in this new technology to achieve things in ceramics that are never possible has been something that's uh, really exciting and rewarding for me. This is a recent show at the Jewish Museum in South Florida. It's a series of ceramic lamps. So these are, this was a show called Fragile Beauty. It was with one of my fellow bakehouse artists, Beatrice Chashamovitz, and the late, great Myra Lear who all three of us were doing work about the environment specifically with coral reefs. Uh, so these are some different types of sculptures that incorporate the 3D scanned uh, branches of coral models. I've also been playing a lot with form and function design and, and thinking about how ceramics can be functional. So these are actually, uh, by casting them in porcelain at night, they actually glow. So on the right-hand side is the lamp with the light on, on the left-hand side is with no light. So playing with the translucency of porcelain to achieve different types of lighting effects has been really, really fun. And my last project, this is something that just debuted at Mad Arts in Dania Beach. It's a new experimental art space that is building out an immersive museum using tech and art with a focus on NFTs. So I basically this past month taught myself all about NFTs. I didn't really understand them or what they were for, especially with the crash of cryptocurrency. I was very confused. But after attending the uh, NFT conference last week and participating in the show, it was very interesting to me to think about NFTs as a way to build community and to have people follow you and invest in your work. And I thought since I work so digitally, it might be interesting to preserve these different types of environment in that moment in time. So this is a 3D scan from a recent scuba dive excursion in the Florida Keys in December uh, with the Coral Restoration Foundation. This location is called Perry Sport Reef. In the 70s, it was a huge thicket of elkhorn coral that were thriving and growing. It was like one of the pride and joy of the Keys. Uh, now it's completely gone and decimated. And it's one of the new, it's one of the seven mission iconic sites through NOAA that is trying to restore these different parts of reefs. So there's an initiative called Coral Gardening, which for me, with my interest in plants and ecology and the idea of the relationship between man and nature, the idea of sort of manipulating our underwater gardens, just like landscaping above the water is, is super interesting to me. So I've been documenting these different sites in South Florida, places where reefs are being restored. On the left-hand side, this little slice here is the actual photograph. On the right-hand side, this is the 3D scan of the reef. You can see here, this is one of the locations. My, uh, I'm not claiming to be a videographer or a photographer. Uh, you can see here, even these new restored uh, staghorn corals are starting to bleach. So. It is a little bit dismal to think about the amount of time, but ultimately what coral gardening does is it cultivates interest from the community to kind of maintain these ecosystems, and it buys a little bit of time until we can figure out our, our carbon emissions problem. And on the right-hand side, you can see uh, sort of a video that shows you the data point cloud when you do photogrammetry. So you see all these little kind of speckles. That's all the extra photogrammetric data that you can actually go in and delete. So. For me, when I get a scan, I can actually choose what to include by highlighting these different pixels or these different mesh dots and deleting or, or highlighting them to create a, a, a 3D scan. And this is the piece that is at MadArtSpace. I did an NFT, which is a rotating 
model slice of the landscape of Cary Sport Reef at that moment in time, which is the NFT. And then on the left-hand side is a projection on top of a sculpture of the 3D model of the reef. And so here's a close-up. And this show will be up for the next two and a half weeks, so you can still see it. It's at Dania Beach. It's a group show with a lot of amazing artists, and it's something super interesting. So I recommend going to check it out. This is the sculpture. And finally, this is the, the NFT. So the NFT is available for auction. You can actually bid on it. I set the reserve price to zero because I'm just trying to um, get people in on it early if you want to collect this piece of environmental art for all of time and all of perpetuity on the blockchain. And that is pretty much it. I need to drink water now. That was a full hour of talking. That was that was so fascinating. I We have... Over the years, I have over the years uh, seen so such an increasing number of artists dealing with the environment in so many ways, and it's it's collectively it's an incredibly powerful way of raising awareness, raising conversation, um, it, and it accumulates in your mind. I think. So. Yeah, there's there's been a lot of, in the last 10, 15, I mean, there's artists obviously that have been doing it longer, but I think a lot of artists, especially in Miami, are, are environmentally focused. One, because we're kind of like the test child, the, the poster test child for the rest of the, the world, right? We're at, we're at zero sea level. We are a, a huge urban space. That is, nobody is stop, stopping building here. I don't know. You cannot run scaffolding in Miami. It's insane. Like, the buildings are going up. They They do not care about sea level rise or anything like that. There's also, I will say, a fair amount of support uh, through grants and other types of uh, philanthropic support and funding for people doing the environment. So I think that encourages artists to really explore that medium and get support for that. Uh, so I think those two things together, there's quite a, uh, quite a force of people um, really thinking about these issues, which is great. Lauren, this has been an absolutely fascinating evening. We have learned a great deal more, those of us who are not ceramic artists, about processes in ceramic art, about environmental art, about uh, paying attention to the materials that we use and, and trying to use less and recycle more um, about making art relevant to the environment and, and reaching people. Uh, this has been just a wonderful evening. And for all of us, I thank you very, very much. Thank you.